great. Um, so I just want to give you a brief history of Surefoot and how it got started. Uh, as you know, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner and I studied Feldenkrais for 16 years with a variety of people. So, and I'm team, I've been around team since 85. Um, so we're always asking questions and looking for new ideas. I think that's one of the most important things that we do. Um, so I saw a horse, his name was Dante. I would see him on Monday, Tuesday, every month at Morvin Park. I had been working on him for three years with Feldenkrais. He was lame when I met him. He had flipped over a stall door. And um, when I would work with him, he would not let me work with the rider. <laughs> I could only work with Dante. She changed the saddle in the month between. She wanted a jumping saddle. She showed up for the lesson. The horse was lame in the right hind leg. We switched the saddle back. He was still off. That night, because I was going to see him the next day, Dr. Joyce Harmon was talking to me on the phone. My horse lives at her house. We're best friends. It's very handy. <laughs> um, and she wanted to stand at her computer because it's before standing desks really became popular and she was talking about a pad to stand on. And while we were talking about that, she started telling me about how they're putting dogs on different kinds of pads for rehab. So in the conversation, I said, do you think that'll work for horses? And she said, I don't know. Give it a shot. Time it for 15 seconds. So there's been two events in my life that have completely changed my life. Raise it up. How's that? Higher? Yay. Um, the first one was when the horse flipped on top of me and rolled over me and punched my femur through the socket and somebody gave me a team newsletter while I was in the hospital. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter Purdy. Um, and the second was putting a pad under a horse's foot. I timed it for 15 seconds and he walked off completely different and I was blown away. So I spent the hour messing around with this horse and he totally changed. The next horse was a quarter horse, had been Western pleasured when we wanted to invent it, messed around with that horse, completely round canner. Next horse was a halflinger and it was Catherine Wyckoff's horse. And I messed with him and I had a round canner out of a halflinger and Catherine is a Feldenkrais practitioner, PT, hippotherapy, uh, knows Linda. Um, and we were like going, what have we done, right? And so that just started me putting pads under every single horse I could find. Um, I was now addicted. It becomes incredibly addictive um, because every horse is, is slightly different and every uh, horse is an opportunity to learn something. And the basis of Feldenkrais that Mia Siegel, my, my mentor, told me is that the movement is an excuse to learn something. And with Surefoot, the pads are an excuse to learn something. And it's something we either learn in terms of the horse's ability to do the pads or inability to do the pads or how he responds to the pads or what he does when he's on them. And more importantly, what does he do when he gets off? And it's that process that is the key to Surefoot, the process of observation the process of asking questions, the process of offering to the horse. So I, I've thought long and hard about this. And even when it's positive, we're always asking something of the horse. Stand quietly, go in a stall, be tacked up, be ridden, be driven. We're always asking something of the horse. And with Surefoot, we are offering something to the horse. We're saying to the horse, what would you like? Would you like this density or this one? Would you like this foot or this one? Would you not like the pads at all? And that's all okay. There are only two rules. Keep your hands away from the hoof <laughs> and listen to the horse. Everything else, I love Robin's expression, is written in sand. Everything else happens in the moment of observation. Uh, keep your hands away from the hoof. <laughs> The horse gets to vote. He gets to tell you what he wants. So one of the things that's fascinating about it is, is watching the owner's response because we're so invested in the horse doing it right and being a good citizen. And so people go, go ahead, pick up your foot, pick up your foot. And it's like, I don't care if he picks up his foot. What I'm observing is this horse doesn't want to give me this foot. So I'm going to go ask another foot as opposed to, he's, you know, be good. That is so difficult for people to accept. It's so difficult for people to go, okay, so he's telling me something. What do I need to do here? What do I need to listen to? How do I respond to that? And so we get to start seeing how people 
relate to their horses, how the horses relate to different environments. I mean, it's, it's, I think of it as like a magnifying glass and it just takes what's kind of very small and hard to see and blows it up onto a big screen. And it makes things so obvious. And then in that observation is where we as practitioners can point things out to people. Look at how he's standing on the pad. He's got more weight on this side of his foot. When I picked up his leg, he felt really stiff or he had to put it down fast. Those are all clues. And our job is to be a detective. What did, what, okay, that foot, he picks up and he puts it up in his earlobe. This one he could barely lift up. Wow, isn't that my favorite phrase? Isn't that interesting? Thank you, Linda. <laughs> the first time I heard her say that, I thought she was nuts. <laughs> it was in 1985, I was a scientist. I came from my master's degree up to my first clinic in Wisconsin and I got there late and she's doing little tea touches on Falcon River's toes. <laughs> Okay, so um, in my, I walk a very interesting world. I walk a line between many different things and I do that on purpose. I can walk into the horsemanship world, I can walk into the dressage world, I can walk into the hunter world. And I purposely keep myself as neutral as possible because as that, I can go in and make change. I can affect change. And I've written for magazines for years that are all horsemanship and I've, met a lot of them and I never give them my opinion. <laughs> I learned to keep my mouth shut because if I come in with an agenda, it's like the horses. If I come in with an agenda, I've lost them. But if I come in with looking at what they're doing and then suggesting something, I might bring them to me, to another idea. And I was just listening to a podcast and this is a little off topic, but a guy who after growing up in white Alabama and being a drug addict, he's now um, an organizer for change. And that was exactly what he's talking about is you have to meet them where they are. You have to go to those places where those people are. And so Surefoot is, uh, it's a very neutral, nobody, it's very non-habitual. Nobody knows what the heck this is. There isn't anything like it. So if you're working with a farrier or you're working with a cowboy, I have, cowboys now that train horses and they put all the horses on pads first so it can go into all of these places because they don't have um a habit they don't have a habit to it they don't have a stigma to it they all think it's weird okay which is great <laughs> they all think it's weird they can't plug it into something that they know but it gives us this window into looking at what the horse is doing and to have a conversation and it's the conversation that's so important. Look at how the horse is standing on the pad. Look at where the weight is. Look at how I can pick up this foot, but not that one. How does that relate to what you feel when you ride? Oh, he falls through the shoulder. Well, wow, look at how his shoulder isn't over his foot. Look at how he sways to the outside. So if I, I the hardest thing is to keep people from putting something onto it. People want to make, yeah, Robin's like totally getting this. Um, people want to say, well, the, you know, that he saw the butterfly yesterday, and so that's why he doesn't want to press that foot on the pad today, right? They, our brain makes up stories. It's the thing that makes it, you know, who else makes up um, spy novels and, and weird universes, right? So because of that, we make up stories about the horse. But if we use the pads as the vehicle to be observant, we can pull them right into what's going on. And it gets so interesting and so curious, it sucks them in. The other thing is that, and the thing that makes it so easy for me to, to if you will, sell this, is it's not me. My work, my day job, I can't do this. My surefoot job, I can do this. Because the minute someone sees a horse on a pad, that's what it's all about. And you can't deny your own experience but you have to experience it to see it. So, you know, if I walk up to somebody and say, yeah, I put horses on squishy pads and they change and then they move different. <laughs> People look at me and think I'm crazy, they do. But if they see it, they're so sucked in, it's so interesting and so novel and so curious that it, it's, it's a powerful change agent. And that's really what Surefoot is, is a change agent for both the horses and the people. Um, I do this mounted and unmounted, 
I do this mounted because my day job is putting my hands on riders. And if I can't do that because the horse is anxious, I can't do my job. But the other really important reason for doing this mounted is that the person on the horse feels every single change the horse makes and cannot deny their own experience. And it then suddenly leads them into a completely different perspective of their horse. So people wanna say, well, my horse, he's just being resistant. He just doesn't wanna to go to the left. And then they're sitting on the horse and they're feeling the horse swaying right, swaying right, swaying right. And then it's like, wow, that's why he can't go left. So, um, yeah, has anybody got any, any, I mean, that's kind of a huge philosophical overview of why I'm out here on a daily basis running around sticking pads on the horse. <laughs> and um, so what's really fascinating is like, as an example, I, uh, last January I went to Costa Rica, we did a retreat. It was a company we didn't know, it's called Equisol. I left them with a set of pads and their horses are totally different this year. The horses are more relaxed, they're more comfortable, they can work in the arena. I mean, it was an agent for change. Um, is it perfect? No. Is it the only thing? No. Is it gonna solve everything? No. Okay. Are there gonna be horses that won't stand on the pads? Yes. Are there horses that won't get off the pads? Yes. <laughs> so the bell curve, you know, I mean, we all know the bell curve. Is there a bell curve? And Surefoot totally fits in here, okay? And you've got horses that won't do it. They won't stand on the pads. Horses that won't get off, right? And then everything in between. Oh, if you're going to turn. I was trying to. Oh, oh, the blank screen. Oh, that's good. Oops. And you know what? I can just draw it. We can just put in an image. Okay, because I'll stay away. From, I can stay away from the whiteboard. You can just put it behind you, too. Oh, there we go. So I, I don't know what your experiences have been with the pads and, and I'd love to hear that, but the one thing I'm gonna tell you is the first time you put a hoof on the pad is the most dangerous and the most important. If something is gonna happen, it's gonna happen then typically. That's not 100%, but typically. So I put a, I have it, uh, I call it an N of one. I have one horse, I picked up his foot, put it on the pad, he exploded straight up exploded. I then another time went back and tried to put his foot on a pad without a ride. The rider was on. Thank God nobody got hurt. Um, he did not give me the indication that would happen when I walked up to him. I worked with him without the rider. I put his foot on the pad. He thought it was the devil. That was it. I videoed him. I showed it to Dr. Joyce Herman. From the video, she says he's neurologic. So there are certain horses that are going to react. If you're compromised, you don't want to be more compromised. If you're already unsteady, you don't want to be more compromised, okay? The other horse was a horse that had been on pads. I had done three different clinics out in Colorado. He'd been on the pads all three times. He had been fine on the pads. This time, I had him on four pads. He had a saddle on. He bronked off without a rider, bronked, okay? So, because I know that can happen, I always err on the side of caution. I never take it for granted that the horse is gonna be okay. And you need to know that something can happen. <coughs> so if you're very conscious of that first time you put that foot down, of making sure you're in a safe environment, there's enough room, there aren't people standing there that might get mowed down, and you always check, and I always take walk up to the, pad, the horse with the pad, and I watch him, I had one horse, I was from here to the end of the room, and he was blowing backwards. He was leaving, took the rider off, did five minutes. Six months later, he's standing without a halter on four pads falling asleep. So you just have to always pay attention. It's really easy to get casual. It's really easy to get casual. Um, but as people who are gonna be doing this and showing other people, it's super important that you understand this can happen. Um, I don't know if you've had any experiences like that. Yeah. And, and, and I think my mistake was I used, uh, I should have actually used um, a firmer pad in yeah. the medium. And uh, I'm not sure that this horse is neurologic, but he definitely has some mental, um, got some emotional yep. stuff going on. And, uh, and I think that probably contributed to it. Not that it was, I mean, he just exploded and left, but uh, he's the only horse I've ever had to use to get him to stand up. He won't stand up anything. 
Right. And, you and now, you know, the going home piece, but um, that I had to actually use um, the clicker and I do too, because otherwise I love the aspect and it's completely their choice. But I thought that something I really course we started um, right and in that that's a very special case and, and so i've been doing this seven years and i only have maybe three but it can ha happen and that's what you need to know is it can happen um yeah so based upon this that safety issue uh, i had one horse that fell over when we came up with Oh, we had one of those two. That, so now we have an NF2 on that, okay. <laughs> and we still got it for a long time, eyes closed. It was also, but I had it in a very small aisle. And so I would imagine that it's probably better to never to do that. It won't be an open, wide open space with the marina. So I learned. Yeah. Uh, because he fell, and, I mean, he fell against the wall and then he sort of got himself up. But, wow. Uh, so the, <laughs> when Linda came to watch me, I had one fall over and uh, I thought I'd killed it. I literally, my heart was going a million miles an hour and Linda kept me from having a complete and total meltdown. <laughs> I mean, she didn't run over and do ear work. So the horse is laying on the ground, I have a photo. And I was like, okay, Linda's not running. So he, he's breathing. Okay, Linda's not running. She kept me talking. And I tell you that I had 20 people standing there watching. Five minutes. Yeah. Was that our that's yeah, our favorite page or was it something? Uh, uh, the horse, the thing that's interesting, the horse that the people who have been training with that trainer who is not like the horse, says that he was described to him. A ADD, Huey, yeah. he's a problem. Right. Got on the pad and within seconds simply fell over and then you and I was watching him. Yeah, I have very little recollection of what happened. <laughs> you know, I was just standing there looking at Linda, and the fact that she wasn't running over to the horse told me that the horse was not dying, and that's the only clue I had. <laughs> wasn't catatonic and it wasn't i don't i don't think it was a faint either actually because he didn't like like see that was that was the one if you would have been easy with him i think he would have made more numbers i think he was in such a state of peace concentration and i think he would have been a lot more than he would have done yeah checked out yeah um, you know, challenge of organization. Yeah, you know? yeah. and neurologically, what's going on? I can't tell you. And Wendy, he wasn't on there. No, I know he wasn't on there long at all. That was the thing that was uh, kind of frightening. <laughs> How did he come out? Fine. He woke up. He got up. I asked if he wanted a pad again. He said no, and they took him back to the barn. Okay, the owner was not there. Yeah. You know, it was the barn. I don't know. I literally have kind of like this very vague picture of the whole thing at this point. <laughs> um, it was so, sh so, so that's, you know, and I think I've seen everything, but I haven't seen everything that's going to happen shortly. Um, the other thing, so I was doing a demo. It was in front of 300 people at the Pennsylvania Horse Expo, and I was supposed to be teaching jumping, and the footing was slick clay, and Anyway, this pony was rearing, and I took the kid off the pony. I walked in front of the audience. I put a pad under his foot. He reared. Okay? I walked him around, put his foot on the pad. He stepped sideways. The third time, he's maybe not even been on a second. Not a second on the pad. The third time, he dropped his neck. The fourth time, he was grazing the ground. And, and I've seen this before with these horses that are really quite high, is they come down so hard that they're literally nuzzling and grazing. Like the, the, the parasympathetic has been triggered so hard, they're right in grazing. Knowing I, that's when I called up Stephen Peters. I said, Stephen, I saw this. He says, you have gone where I can't explain. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> um, so, and I've seen that more than once. Um, and I have, I think I have a video of it. I was just down in Costa Rica and there was a horse down there who, you know, a lot of those horses have come out of abuse and the barn where they're at, they're, they're, 
not a, they're well cared um and this horse literally it was the half physiopad i picked up his foot he touched it with his toe stepped off and yawned and yawned and yawned and yawned i mean like matt and they'd never seen him yawn so yeah when you can you explain that horses that were rearing and then how you put the foot on so the first thing i did was i tapped the pad to the side of the foot and then when I picked it up, I, I just lifted it and, and I, I will show you how, to pick, how I pick up a foot. Um, I use the cannon bone and I come from the tendon side and I just kind of let the foot drop down on a lot of those horses and it just touched it and he just went straight up the minute he had contact. So, you know, it's like, all, if, if you've been using the pads for a while and everything's been quiet and nice, that's great. <laughs> um, because it's so, I mean, how many horses have been on surefoot pads now? I've done seven years of this and there's just these little outliers and it's just important to keep it in the back of your brain that there's an outlier out there. And if you come across it, you know, you always want to plan for the outlier and then you see what the horse does and then you can go from there. That's just the just the word of caution okay and do you always obviously you don't always but start with the front feet is there any reason i start with the front feet from a safety perspective it's strictly a safety perspective for me if i if someone knows their horse like that dante the very first horse i started with his back leg but you're you're safer introducing it from the front than you are from the back and so that's what i, I you know but if I, once I put a foot on a pad and I see how they respond, I can go right to the back once I know. It's just the safety perspective. Um, and so, and I'll, ta I'll take you through all the pads. The, I, I now tell people hard to soft, and we've changed the name of the impression pad to hard because nobody knew where it fit. So hard, hard, hard to soft. So hard is the, I'll pull them all out. Um, the orange is hard. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> orange is hard um do you want me to just run through these real quick okay so um it's the same on both sides it will get soft in warmer temperatures and harder in cold temperatures i've used it at 10 22 degrees with an icelandic still works beautifully okay it's going to give to heat and pressure I'll, I'll, um this material is the highest rated impact foam that there is are you talking centigrade and centigrade. I mean Fahrenheit. Okay, Fahrenheit. So um, this is in your pro football helmets. So I mean that that's the thing is the materials that we use, they're super high grade. And it's the it's been rated, even though the company won't say that, it's been the highest rated impact foam there is. We have people using this for trauma release in people in Switzerland. And how do they do that? They put the people on it. Yeah, and so there's, my gut feeling is, there's something about the high impact that somehow has a reflection to trauma and I can't explain it, I won't even try. Okay, um, we've come out with an, Brynja is my person over in Germany. Um, so they, people push me <laughs> and then we come up with new stuff. So this is the same material, only in a slant form. Okay. So is, is, this, is this what was called the impression pad? This was called the impression yeah, pad? So what about the one in the front one? I haven't gotten there yet. Oh, sorry. So this is the same material as hard, only it's an angle. Because people wanted a, a, a more dense angled pad. So we came up with this. I actually love it. Okay. The next one down is our firm. It's the green top charcoal. Okay. Um, if you have sort of the, the, the 1.0 version, the foam wasn't as durable. When it got hot, it sliced a little easier. We changed it. I've been using this, this pair of pads for a year. That's why it has a number two on it. <laughs> it's uh, still my demo <coughs> prototype. It's been holding up. You know, they'll get cuts, nicks, tears, you know, little breaks. None of that damages the function of the pad. Um, I have a woman... Uh, uh, Felicitas Fundeman Cosell, she's a dressage trainer. She's a Grand Prix rider. She has the pads in her arena. They are used on eight horses a day, five days a week for over a year. Um, yeah, I mean, we've put them to, she's, she's put everything 
to the max test. And the only one she's had some trouble with is the medium. She's doing the stacking, she'll stack three high, and the medium really has too much flex to handle that well. So was that the medium? Nope. So what firm, do you call that one now? Firm. Firm is okay, so we got hard, firm, firm. Okay, so this is the firm slant charcoal yellow top. So this is the same material in two shapes. The pink and green, sorry, pink and orange. Same material in two shapes. Okay. Purple is medium. This is a medical grade foam. My company makes little tiny die cut things about this big. And now we make blocks of foam. <laughs> so um, it is very springy. Um, I can tell that I'm at altitude. This sometimes happens that the glue doesn't hold and you get a bubble. See the bubble? Okay, just prick it with a pin, bubble goes away. Does not harm function. This is the only one, if you're gonna start getting some delamination, meaning that the two layers start to separate, this is the one that's gonna happen. Okay, the reason being it has so much springy flex that it, it, you put a 1500 pound horse on it and it's flexing and it starts challenging the glue. All our glue is 3M and we keep pushing them. So this is the only one that I feel like if a pad's gonna fail, it's gonna be this one. Okay, all the pads are um, warranted if they delaminate, meaning any of the layers come apart or they break, and we've yet to have a pad break, they're replaced. Okay. For what period of time? Lifetime. I stand by my products, you know. Um, and it's in two pieces. Not as opposed to slices. Yeah, slices, tears, corner tears, that sort of thing. Nope. But if because you've got a ten by twelve inch surface here, so you got plenty of room to put a foot on. Um, um, and what I tell people that we every pair of pads has a warranty card. You don't have to send in a card for every pad. Like if you buy three different pairs, send one card, or you can go online. So we have a registry of warranty cards. You register the card. You send me a photo. Like I get a lot of people and it has a nick or a tear and they send me a photo and I say, that's normal wear and tear. I will keep it on file. I keep all of them on file. I have a record of all the damage pads that have been reported. And then they can come back to me and said it failed and I'll replace it. Okay. Uh, we get to soft. Blue top. Cream foam. This one drove all the colors, by the way. Because we, we had to order so much product to get the foam a different color that that's why it's, everything relates to this, okay? It's the squishiest. You're all gonna stand on all of them so you feel them all. That's the only way to understand them. Um, on the purple, blue, and green, you can use, as you can see, you can use either side. I tell people typically in the cold weather to use the uncoated side. The reason being that this little white line indicates that that is the an, a eighth of an inch of hard material. And so in the cold, it responds slower. And so that's why it can crack, okay? Um, but again, you can see, I've, I've used this pad for a year and you know that I use my pads, right? And that's all the damage that's on that pad. So the um, soft, you can use either side. The purple, you can use the two sides. I'll have you stand on them so you feel that. Um, the only thing you have to be careful of with the soft is that if a horse stands on it for five minutes and it's kind of a warm day, it'll actually mold to the foot so much it can stick to the foot when they walk <coughs> off. <laughs> okay, so you just have, if you see the horse start to lift the foot and the pad came with it, just stick your foot on the pad and pop it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but by the time you're doing that, you know the horse is fine with it. And if you're at all concerned, use the uncoated side. It will not happen on this side. It will only happen on this side. Okay. Yep. Uh, just to add you to that, you can follow up right there. So you said the purple is the medical form. Yep. Uh, you mentioned orange, sorry, I didn't write that down. It's high impact. Yep, it's designed for concussion. Um, which is what the, the helmet is. Okay, and uh, what about the medium substitution? Um, it's a, no, 
I mean, we upgraded it from what it was. It's not really important what it is. It's, um, and yeah, you know, you can see that it has marks and stuff and you can feel that. In the cold, this one might look like it's gotten squished down, just warm it up and it'll pop right back. In other words, Felicitas was using it at 22 degrees for a few days and she said, the, she sent me a picture and it still had the impression of a foot on it. And I said, just put it in your tackle. Because it just was so cold that it couldn't return to. Yeah, I put the whole pair of still when they seem to have problems on the front, but it's minus 20 Celsius. Oh, absolutely. And the problem with those pads is that they're molded foam. So that's where I started because there was, we didn't have anything. I created a category. So if any of you have used the TheraBand pads or familiar with the TheraBand pads, they're oval. They're molded foam, which means if you get any nick in the surface, the foam expands and the pad. I, they, they, you can beat them up like crazy. that you know it, you've lived the pads have worked and they've done a lot of horses a lot of good and and as opposed to they're going to stay pretty um, we made the colors pretty for people but the downside is they want them to stay there. okay um yep no we don't because the materials just won't work as a slant yep okay um these two here, again, these were born out of trying to solve something. And so for the farriers, we wanted to give the horses, we wanted to give the horses comfort and not instability, right? So the two inch thick pads, people are using them for the farrier, but they're gonna have more give, not so stable. So um, we came up with this one. It's the only one that has two different bones. It has an inch of hard and a half inch of medium and it comes in half and full, okay? The, I, over in Europe now, they're using the full pad when they're doing things like NeuroStim. You know what NeuroStim is, some piece of equipment that they use. So they put the horses on the pads. The physical therapists over there are so far ahead of us, okay? Um, but they put the horse on the pads and then they do their treatment. Um, you can put the horse on the pad and then treat them, whether it's a farrier to make them comfortable. So the idea behind this one is make it, comfortable so it's safe for farrier and horse that was really our idea we want to make it safer because the horse can stay on there and be comfortable um we've been to hoof summit three times now with our products we have um daisy bicking if you've ever heard of her she's totally behind it she field tested our big pad i couldn't get it back so we knew we had a winner <laughs> i sent Six half pads and a full set of pads to WEG. They were supposed to go to Hoof Summit to get auctioned off. Not a pair of pads made it to Hoof Summit. Okay, so they, they disappeared. The guys never gave them back. Um, James Gilchrist was the lead farrier at WEG. I have a picture, I think it's in my slideshow. Um, he heard a horse was coming to him that had a problem, a Swedish horse. He took the half pad, it was, it's still in its wrapper. I have the photo, it's still in its wrapper. They put the horse on the pad. It says it bought him enough time to get the care the horse needed. So it was, um, the other thing is some people wanna call it the emergency pad. We've had horses that are colicking, we put them on the pad, they stop colicking. I'm not saying that's gonna happen every time, but if you have a pad, any pad, and you have a horse colicking, offer them a pad, see if they want it. If you can buy some time, that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to fix a problem, you're trying to buy time. You're trying to make the horse comfortable till the vet can get there. You do all your teamwork and everything. It's just another tool in your kit, okay? Limited courses, the, typically the soft and the slants. They love the slants, either acutely or um, chronically. 
Okay, the, the latest pad, the one, so, oh, it's underneath 19. <laughs> it's under my laptop, okay, but I have the slant. So um, when we were at Hoof Summit last year, we had vets come up to us and say, we want a radiograph block. We want a block that the horses want to stand on because they don't like the wood. So the one underneath the computer is the one that we've come up with. It's, um, it's heavy and solid. This is a totally different material from all the others. It doesn't have the give, but what it has is just enough give that the hoof feels secure so that the horse wants to stand on it. Um, we're, they've asked over in Europe, they asked me for slants. We haven't even tested them yet. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so we're up to the Innovation Award at Equitana. It's our third time. The first time was the concept, the second time was the pads, and the third time was the radiograph block. Yeah. And we'll are see those, if, we'll, yeah. Are those two different layers of one go underneath the computer? That's a solid block. Okay, so that little yellow line doesn't indicate it's a separate. It's a layer. It's a, it's a, it's a laminated layer. Yeah, so the two on either side are different but not the same. Correct. Okay. Yep, it's just one is white and one is coated. We're, we wanted it very neutral, so not interfere with x-rays. We're looking at, there's an, a system where they can actually take photographs and things, and we're looking at that to start adding the appropriate holes, if you will, into this to, to use that other system. I just had somebody send me thermograph pictures. I haven't done any, but I, that person looks like they're interested in doing a little study, so um, they posted one on that group page. Oh, they have to, they have to, they have to. on the pads. Yep, and that in that case, I would suggest that one. Um, any questions about the pads themselves? Well, I'll have them out. We'll stand on all of them. It's the best way to know. Oh, to know the differences. Um, the single question I'm asked the most is, which one do I start with? <laughs> okay, um, if if the horse is basically a calm horse, I tell them firm. If there's any kind of anxiety, horse that pulls back, nervous, unsure about different footing, um, unstable, hard. So I'm working on how I can make that easier to help people navigate that idea of where do I start. Um, I've just, somebody, um, talk to me down in Costa Rica about creating an app, which I'm going to totally investigate because that would be the simplest way. Right now people email me. Um, but I know that's the single question that's the hardest to answer. And that's where having you guys out in the field with pads and go up to the horse and, you know, you go, well, let's see. And you see what the horse likes, then they have a start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. So if it's a, a horse that's calm, it doesn't have any real issues, um, then firm, right? Um, I hate to call it normal, but uh, sort of your average horse. If your horse is anxious, pulls back, is unstable, is nervous on different footing, um, shows any signs of agitation, I go hard. And the reason for that is I want it to be as ground-like as possible to begin with. So I'll even start with a half physio pad, right? And just make sure, you know, like if I put your foot on this pad, are you going to flip out? <laughs> it's kind of my question. Um, so the hard pad is going to feel firm and then give to heat and pressure. So what you typically see is the horse stands on it, and he's looking around and then you start to see over a minute or two, the eyes get droopy and the head starts to come down. And when they step off, there's no spring. So all the other pads when they step off are gonna rebound to some degree and the hard will not rebound. It will give to heat and pressure and it will hold that. That's why we used to call it the impression pad. It will hold that when they step off. So no spring, no panic moment. Well, that's why carriers like Yep. Um, if, at, if I'm at all concerned about a horse when I put his foot on a pad, I take his foot off before I move him. I pick up his foot and take it off. 
any horse that's shown me any kind of anxiety about that, a little nervous, unsure about, I just lift the foot up and take it off, kick it out of the way and let him walk. I don't even consider the idea that if he pushes and feels the spring, he might be upset. Do you progress towards towards a medium then? I, I go through the progression. I'll start hard and I work through to, to soft. Okay. Not in one session necessarily. Um, there are some horses where I might go hard medium, hard firm, firm's next in line, straight to soft. Um, you're flat-footed thoroughbreds with sensitive soles. You're tender-footed horse, your lemonetic horse. I'll, I'll try and get to that. So I want to give them so much comfort. Like this is the best pair of bedroom slippers you have ever stood on. So that I think of soft is just the most comfortable thing I can offer them. Medium is springy. If I have a really horse that's flat to the ground, you know, heavy, doesn't kind of have a lightness in its step, I'll use the medium because I want to say, hey, you know, you could be a little bit springier. Firm, firm is my like standard go-to when in doubt, firm. It's my everyday day. If I could only take one pair, I'd take firm. Okay. Other questions? I have another one. Yeah. I don't like to hog the question, so. It's okay. So uh, what I see is it has a huge effect on, on how the shoulder connects. So I was curious to know if you notice uh, an increase in a d deeper breath with the medium, say, than with the high. I can't say that. Okay. I can I tell you that I see. It. I just have the old Theraband, and I, I notice that there. Yeah. More, the more so you soft. only, with Theraband, you only have firm and soft, essentially. So with the soft one, I notice, uh, I notice a deeper breath, softening through the whole connect, shoulder connection. Yeah. At least that's what I, I don't do it on thousands of horses. So right. I'm just curious. To um, what I will tell you, so, so research. This is really where I'm trying to get to, into, is to have something to back up what we're seeing, because... It just opens doors. Um, so, one of. So if you don't have empirical evidence, there's no reason to do research, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that's very true. Without empirical evidence, why do research? Um, and so, um, there, I don't know if you've heard of the, it's FAC something. They have mapped out all the muscles in the horse's face. And they have come up with 17 different facial expressions, but what they don't have on the list is relaxation. <laughs> I looked at the list, I was like, wait a second, where's sleepy, where's relax, it's not on the list. Well, okay, but. Everybody can describe pain, but they can't describe ease. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is that since, since that is already in the research, in the literature, using facial expression as a means of showing a change, and all I'm trying to, I'm not trying to put any words to the change, just that there's a change. So we started to video, horses just to kind of get a feel for how we do this. And when we started timing it, there's a breathing change in three to 10 seconds. So that's the, the kind of information that, I can't say it's a deeper breath, but I can say that we typically see a breathing change in three to 10 seconds. Oh, I, I brought mine with me. I got a whole new one. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> Um, so, so what, the, what I've got to do is write that protocol and what I'm going to do is look at, um, in fact, on the Surefoot group, I posted Bess, Bess Miller has written up a really nice little sheet to help people learn to observe. And it talks about, you know, muzzle, muzzle movements, nostril movements, eye blinks, ear softening. And so we see all those things, right? And what I've got to do is kind of narrow it down to like five to do a study because otherwise we're gonna go crazy. Um, but, it, but it's, <laughs> it should be, what I'm thinking, what I'm trying to do is come up with something that's simple enough that any one of us put a video camera on when the horse goes on the pan, video the face and then ship it off to somebody who counts and they count eye blinks, nostrils, uh, um, ear softening, you know, and maybe two other things. Because that way we can all become part of the research project. Anybody with a, with a camera stands at, 
you know, this position with the camera, somebody puts a foot on the pad, we collect the data, send it off. So that's where I'm going in my head in terms of sort of the crowdsourcing study. Um, I, I have had polar heart monitors for years. When I was at Equitana the first time, we put a polar heart monitor on the horse. What I can say is it doesn't cause the heart rate to go up. I haven't had horses with elevated heart rates to see them drop yet. So, so that's the tricky part. However, there's a new, new app. It's Hilo Fit. They've been looking at heart rate and the app's actually designed for horses and they have a girth strap you can put it on so you don't have a band around their, their whole body. Um, and I brought it with me. I have yet to have test it out yet, but my polar <coughs> monitor is done. So heart rate is one of the things that I wanna see if we can get to. There's a, there's a therapeutic uh, group for animals, uh, equine therapy group in Australia, and they're, they're actually looking at heart rate therapy. Mm. So that's developed with you. How are they? Yeah, we, oh, we'll no, talk because it's how they're measuring it. So HVR, heart rate variation, is actually more accurate than heart rate, but you have to have a system that monitors it and then a way. So those, but I do have in Australia, um, Raquel Butler at Strut, Charles Strutt University. She's just gotten her approvals for, they have to get approvals for animal studies. She's gotten her approvals and she's going to be studying Surefoot. And um, I have a grad student at Audubon University that come fall, she's going to be doing a research project. I have a person in England that's looking at proprioception. She's gonna, so I'm starting to get independent people coming to me and saying, I want to do a study and I want to use Surefoot. And so I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is supporting them with product and just looking over, because I have a master's degree, I'm a scientist by training, um, looking over their protocol to just give them recommendations you know, stick with one pair of pads and here's your run time and that, the things that I need to help them because it's too easy to get so out of control that you can't come up with any statistically significant data. I think I was thinking about something that I watched that day in the way they changed the soft to pink butter. And I was thinking of course of all the dogs that come and they give a lot of stuff. What happened that I was thinking that when you get them on four pads, it's like suddenly they had four feet on the ground. And suddenly the eyes are coming up through the whole body. The changing it's like there is a just this balance that happens in yeah. the mind and the body that happens. It was really amazing. So tranquil is the one of the words I've been playing with lately. Is there's so Stephen. Peters, do you know who Stephen Peters is? Okay, if you don't, he is a neuropsychologist in humans and he studies, he works with people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, memory loss. He's a super smart guy in the human world. He's a hobby horse, he rides horses as a hobby. And he is out west and asked five different horsemen the same question, they gave him five answers. He said the brain can't possibly be that different. And he got a horse's brain and he dissected it and he started looking at what parts of the brain the horse has. And he comes from neuroscience as opposed to behavior mod, okay? So he says they have an amygdala, they have a hippocampus, that's where memory stored, they have a motor cortex, they have a brainstem, they have this little tiny bit of frontal lobe. Okay, so given that, he's looked at the structure of the brain and he understands neuroscience and neurochemicals. Um, and so he called me one day and said, you know, I've been thinking about this. And when you lay a horse down, not when they lay down on their own, but when you lay a horse down, the horse goes into what's called quiescence. Meaning if you've ever seen an animal about to be, to die, to be eaten, like, you know, in Africa, they go into a state of ex what we might call acceptance, okay, uh, or giving up. And you see this when you lay a horse down. And so his question is, what if we're triggering a semi-state of quiescence? A semi-state, not a full-blown state, because they don't, they're not laying down, but a partial state. And he described to me 
and this is where I'm not a neuroscientist, he described to me how that works in the brain, what the brain does, where it's active and that sort of thing for this quiescence. And, you know, very often the reason people lay horses down is because when they get up, they're different. There's a change. And so are we, and this is a question that we can't answer, are we triggering some level of quiescence, which is why we see some of the profound changes when they get off the pads. I mean, I've seen horses come off the pads and be completely different. Yeah, you have too. And other horses, no. Other horses, they need to see the pads on a repeated basis, and I'll explain that in a minute. But why do we see just a profound change? And this could be an answer. It could be um, the singular, oh, I can't remember the term you used, the bleh, in the brain. <laughs> um, the, but maybe that's what we're triggering. And without research, we don't know. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Now, you know that on the, on the website of the video, you talk about not using poo poo. Um, and it's interesting because what Nina just describes so, one of my horses, I wanted to see the effect of by using, I had to use poo poo and mm -hmm. so I, I used the treats to get him to, to, get, to stay on the pads. But that is very different and it does not have the same effect at all. So oh, wow. I I cannot get him at on him stand on all fours. Right. But I wanted to see what the effect would be if I just keep giving him a click and a treat to stand there and you do not get that effect at all. Because I think it's a totally different system. It sure it is. That is activated and, and it's almost like it stops the that quiescence reaction. Yeah. It's you know, I, I think that was the thing when you were like the first time that I saw them. It's just the thing that I was happiest about. Is the only thing that makes the person kick. It's like yeah. the same thing. You're you're going to get the person to do this thing. And it it, it really was the delay to the effect of it. So I was so clear when you got back the ones that were yeah, this is for us. Yeah. It really did give you. And it is um not a lot interested. And that one Icelandic that I, I told you about that was so profound, very high headed, had been a competition horse, eleven years old. Considered really high, should be really good, high, high potential. Um, so high headed, jammed through the base of his neck, nervous that so he came to a horse in Holland for a course of two days and did this as we were doing his offer to sit down with that. When we went came to riding, he she got on and balanced her and so on. Um, stood on the pads, he stood on the pads and his head just dropped. And he actually didn't want to get off the pads. So we I just had to gently encourage him. Got off the pads, head down, walked around, walked right back to the pads, stood in front of him again. So the three times yeah. that he would, and that every time he was a little different. And she carried on using them. And this horse had no trot, has a trot, can canter in an arena. Was but he would stand on his own in a paddock. To put him on, he'd just stand there on his own on the pad. And it, but it completely changed his frontal leg or both was it on frontal leg? Frontal leg. Yeah, it is not not necessary to be on all fours. No, I just was curious. Yeah. Sarah, about that. you had a question. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just thinking in the nervous system there. It's possible like the, the parasympathetic nervous system has the old dorsal vagus area, uh, which has actually when it's activated, it goes into freeze, and then it's low tone. It's actually the place that the body needs to go in order to process. That's where the integration happens, and that's where the so. Um, in order to go check if something feels safe or if it feels good, when the body goes into low tone, that's also the place you go when you go into rest and sleep, and you go into regeneration, and mm. all those other things. So it's quite possible that they're dropping into the low tone dorsal vagal um, response, which is a, uh, and which can take you into sleep or take you into that super calm place. Um, in addition, and it actually is part of the response that we talk about in the ventral vagal and the sort of the thinking. Um, at ease kind of horse, the grazing horse, has low tone vagal going on as well as ventral vagal going on. So it might just be that it's triggering that part yeah. of it rather I mean, than going into a, a helplessness. Or yeah, a, no, I don't see it as helplessness. Or giving up place. Yeah, that's why I'm like, it's a semi, yeah. because it's not a giving, and the reason I know it's not a giving up place, and this is one of the things that, you know, people are like, well, my horse is asleep. It's like, no, yeah. because you come off the pads and 
not when they're first learning the pads, but after they've learned the pads, they come off, they can perform just like that. They're ready to learn and they're ready to go. So they're not in a uh, drowsy, they appear like totally let down, but they're, they're totally, uh, that's what's so interesting. Yeah, there's a big difference. I would see there's a difference between sort of like giving up things versus being just in modulo universal while you're processing and where you get that place where the body really gets to grab into that Well, it's why I use the word tranquil. Yeah, yeah. Because that kind of describes that, like, I'm really at peace, but I'm not checked out. Yeah. So I, oh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, I have a question then, as you said, courses that are, that are put down, laid down, always get up differently. No, not always. Or frequently do. That's why they laid them down. So you mean uh, cowboys that throw horses, throw them for that reason? That the, not throw them. them. There's a process of laying a horse down that's not throwing the horse okay. down. It's not violent. So it's, 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 it's done to the horse. It's done to the horse. Yeah. Yes. So you mean that, I always thought that was just a matter of sort of, you know, subordination. There, there, it, it all, again, it all depends on how you do it. But there are people that will very calmly and quietly lay a horse down. And then when it gets up, it's different. And their intention is to do that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the people who do it in a more brutal fashion are it's a whole other literally thing. letting the horse know that, you know, I can take you out any time. Right. I mean, that's the thing is that every tool <laughs> has a... That's a place. That's a place. Yeah. Yeah. Linda? Well, I think it's really interesting that When you got up, he was just fine. I Right. Yeah. Yeah. Drowned is a really good word. I mean, there's the, the thing is that it starts opening up the can of worms, right? And we don't have answers. And so what I'm looking at is the very baby step of what's the smallest amount of research we can all do that's really simple. Because I, I literally, there's Dr. Stephen Adair at UT Tennessee has the Equine Rehab Center there. He has every toy on the planet, okay? Everything. And, um, Catherine Wyckoff went there. She was taking his physical therapy course for horses, and they had a horse that when you picked up the front leg, when you put it down, it crossed the other front leg. The vet, the physical therapist, the chiropractor, everybody looked at this horse. It still did it. And Adair had heard about Surefoot, and so Catherine said, well, I have my pads. Would you like a demo? And so he said yes. And so, you know, the physical therapist was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Catherine did the before, pick up the foot and it crossed. She did five minutes of the pads. The after picked up the foot, it went straight down. Five minutes, right? All these guys had worked on this horse. So um, I stopped to see Dr. Adair and he, he supports, he believes in Surefoot and supports it. He does not even recognize Lick and Chew. He says that's woo woo. Um, he's totally a strict scientist over here in proprioception, which is fine, right? And we spent three hours trying to design a study and couldn't. So, so that's why I'm saying I'm trying to come up with something really simple that if we just video the horse's face and then record and count versus video a horse that's not on pads and record and count, it's a simple way in. I spent three hours with, do you know who Bob Bowker is? Bob Bowker is, where's that book? <laughs> okay, he's one of the authors in this book by Pete Ramey. He uh, was at Michigan State University, just retired, and he's a neurophysiologist. And he wrote the chapters in here, and I'll go through it in the slideshow. Um, and he wrote the chapter on all the all the um, 
Oh, uh, I lost the word. Receptors, all the receptors in the horse's foot. And he's been studying it for years. Um, and Dr. Hillary Clayton, you know who she is, McPhail chair, now retired, studying dressage movement. I spent three hours with them, both of them, and we couldn't come up with a simple study. I mean, it's not an easy thing because what do you pick? Which parameter? So, the, as you say, the, the empirical is driving the evidence, right? We know it works, we've seen it work, we've all done it. Um, it'd be nice to have data that's gonna be years on the process. That's one of the things I'm in the background trying to organize because it will simply give us credibility. It may explain what we're doing, it may not. And it doesn't really matter to the horses. So in the field, it's one thing, but I think in the bigger picture of acceptance in terms of the uh, AEP, the ABMA, you know, the ISES, all those organizations that there's some importance to it and credibility. Although the fact that you have so many reviews on the internet, that they're, you know, they record what the issue was, they record what they do, I think that's also a little Actually, you're right. They might you might ask if you go to something, you might ask them to add just one or two more little observations with yeah. whatever they already do. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um any questions on that? <coughs> um, yeah, I know a million, and I'm here all the I uh, okay, so <coughs> the pods, they these are just they're human pods, but they're really, really handy. They're what I consider as advanced um at altitude, they get really puffy. <laughs> That's how I knew I was hot. Um, the beauty of the pods, and I, I'll show you some video. The beauty of the pods is that I, and I don't force it, but I aim for the third row of dots to put the hoof down. And when I do, you can see how the habitual pattern of the, how the foot lands. In other words, toe loading, heel loading, side loading, side slipping, and the pod will give, you want it on a dirt surface, it will give it. So the horse puts his foot down and he kind of lands like this. And the next thing it starts to slide and the horse goes, oh, my foot's sliding. And then you repeat and he might toe load and then the pod slides like this, oh. And, he, and then the third time straight down, straight load, right down on the center, right through the center of the balance. And so it's, it's really handy as an observation for how, what that habit is about meeting the ground. Um, you all know that basically the farrier is chasing the foot. If the habit continues, he's going to chase the foot. If we change the habit, we could change the foot. Um, I have one person who she does her own horses. They're barefoot. She's used sure foot for years. She's seen a change in the hoof shape. That would be another study I would absolutely love. It would have to be a year-long study with horses, go, barefoot horses going on pads and trimming them. And I literally think you'll see the feet change and become more balanced because the load is more balanced because it's gotten the feedback it needs to go there. Just another study. <laughs> so when you put these on, you put it so that you can see three rows in front of the toe? I try. Okay, okay so when I, when I pick up the foot and I go to put it down, I aim so that the toe is gonna land just above the third row. Um, but where it lands, it lands. I'm not, you know, I'm guiding from the cannon bone. And um, let me just see if I can, since I've just talked about it. It's a little bit like if you know what you do, you can do what you want. Absolutely. You know, and this is where the horses, they, they, you can see them going, oh, oh, wait, <laughs> where'd my foot go? I want it here, right? You can see them doing that. Um, videos so um, in horses there's something like in farriers they'll talk about high low toe heel right so one toe down one heel down this is great for high low um, because the horses feel that and they shift it's never where you want it when you want it oh that's another I mean we all have great surefoot stories um, Yeah, I just have to get to the video because I thought I knew where it was and it hasn't appeared yet. Oh, it's October. Yeah. Oh, I know. What you see when you put a horse on a hard pad, the impression that you get, 
and how you see them low on the pod? Um, to be honest, I can't say that I have tracked that. Uh, because by the time I get to the pods, they've been through the other pads. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, okay, so, so I want to share my screen, right? Share. Desktop. Oh, wait, there it is, desktop. Share. Let me know. Yep. So this horse, you can see that we're not going to, and this is, gonna, we're not going to talk about the shoeing. I'm not a farrier. Watch the pastures. Yeah, and you see how that ex the experiment? And so that's that, and, and what you have to realize right now is a, it's a really nice load on the pod. So you can see the third row of dots were about the fourth row. So the foot's centered on the pods, right? And um, let me see if I have, I have it from another angle. Little tiny movements. So, so when you get to pods, you've been through all the pads, right? Um, although I've had horses, I had a, I had a demo horse at an expo. She had ha broken her jaw. She was a Greg Best student. He sent her to me. And that horse got on pods at the expo and um, totally grooved and she cried. The horse completely changed. Um, this horse, just as a, to see a stacking, this was a barrel racing horse. Um, so I've stacked three pads there and just, and he didn't want it on the other foot. Okay. And you can see the, the chest, I'm sorry for the bad videography. Um, but you can see how uneven the chest is, but he was totally content there, like totally happy. Um, and so again, it's like, what does the horse want? Um, so was there anything that made you decide to stack them? Horse couldn't turn one direction. So I, I, I start with the general rule of go as far away from the problem as possible. So keep yourself safe. That means stay at the front feet if you're concerned about the back feet and go as far away as possible. Let the horse experience the pads on what would be the easiest foot to pick up or the one that they're most, like sometimes we think it's gonna be the easy foot, but it's the one they're relying on. I gotta stand on this, like I can't, this is my injured one, but I've gotta, okay, fine. Then I'll go to the one that they'll give me, right? Um, and then I'll go to where the issue is. Because if I confront them too soon without them kind of getting an idea of, okay, this is, I get choices here, this feels good, I, you know. I, <sighs> yep. Yeah, so you just, so, so this horse here, this is what I was just telling you about down in Costa Rica. He's not even on the pad. He literally just grazed the pad, and then this is how much release we got. Yeah. And, and he then, like, I mean, he did that, like, right from the get-go. It Literally, the toe grazed the pad. He stepped off and started doing that. Um, so he's, he's out here on the bell curve, way out, to have that kind of amount of release on that minimal exposure. Um, why don't I, let's see, it's 1031. Do you guys need a short break? Okay, so we'll take a short break and then I'll come back and run through the slideshow.